Uh, thank you all for coming out. Um, you all know me. Uh, my name is Tom Pitt, automotive instructor, Hardin County Schools, Early College and Career Center. Uh, and we have some folks here with us from Toyota. We have uh, Cole Miller. He is from Swope Toyota. He's the service manager up there. He's going to speak to you just a little bit. Uh, and we have uh, Johnny Holton, and he is from Toyota. How would you say it? North America. Okay. Yeah. Okay, North North America, uh, and corporate. Yeah, I always say Toyota corporate. Uh, so he's going to talk to you a little bit about collision avoidance, and uh, he's going to give you some of the training that uh, technicians have to undergo uh, in order to be able to do warranty work and and to do work on Toyotas. So uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, yeah, that kind of helps this move along. So uh, be respectful, be respectable, and give them your undivided attention. Swope Toyota is putting in the effort to get Toyota here today to speak with you guys to, to expose you to what it is that we need. We need highly trained individuals. We need individuals that are willing to be leaders. We need individuals that, that want to use what you got upstairs here, okay? We need people who can take data, they can absorb it, they can understand it, they can work with it, they can make decisions and repair vehicles, okay? It takes a very dedicated individual to do this. In the earlier group, I told them there were two analogies that I like to use. One was the Marines and the other was the medical field. The Marines always say what? The few, the proud, right? Because there's just not very many who go in who actually make it, right? They can't make the cut. They don't want to put in the effort. A highly trained technician today, which in the Toyota world we call it an MDT, a Master Diagnostic Technician, they are very few, but they are very proud. It takes a long, hard road to get there. It takes a lot of dedication. It takes a lot of hard work. Math, communication skills, writing, English, all that good stuff. That's what it goes into doing it. So you can't just say, well, I'm going to come out and I'm going to go out and get me a toolbox and get me some wrenches and go over there and put turbochargers on and play with cars. It doesn't work that way in this field. It's a very high-tech area, okay? We need you guys. We need you guys to come in go through the EC3 program, which by the way is probably the best in the nation in high school right now. And then we're going over to ECTC, who is one of the best in the nation, if not the best. I mean, they're great. We need you to go through those programs, get that education, get out into the workforce, get some experience, and come to work for us. That's what we want. So we're putting forth the effort to get Toyota here today to expose you guys because we need highly trained individuals. And we're looking to hire you, and we're looking to compensate you very well for that but you got to put forth the effort, okay? So take advantage of everything that Mr. Holton has to tell you today. If you get a little sleep, sleepy, smack yourself around, wake up, because the things he's going to be talking to you about is what is today. And we all know with technology, if you don't stay with it, what happens? You get left behind, right? I've graduated from the EC, I can't say it, ECTC, 1993, and I go to school all the time been going to school, never stop. Johnny never stops going to school, constantly going to school to learn so we can keep up. So we're what? In demand, right? And we want you to be in demand. So take advantage of what we got to give to you today, okay? Thank you guys. If you can work on cars, you can make a living doing just about anything because everything has some sort of a mechanical process to it, right? It doesn't matter whether it's a toaster or a lawnmower. If you, if you can work on cars, you'll never be unemployed. You'll never be without a job unless it's just flat something you don't want to do. So there's a, there's a lot of jobs out there. Uh, the job market's going to explode, especially for automotive technicians, because there's a lot of guys my age, Cole's age, that, you know, we're okay right now, but 10 years from now, we're going to be retired. Somebody's going to need to take our place. And that's one of the things that we talk to dealers about now. What happens to guys that are MDTs today, you know, four or five years from now, they're going to be 65 years old. You're not going to be able to do this job, you know, you know, when, when, you're, when you're an elderly guy, you know, your walker gets in the way when you try to get under the racks. So it's, and, and, and the, the, the things that you folks have grown up with, we didn't have. Now, by that, I mean, you know, you've been using cell phones your whole life, pretty much. You know how to do everything with a cell phone. You know how to do this. You know how to edit movies. You know how to put stuff on YouTube, you know. Anything computer-based is going to come much easier for you folks than it did for, for Cole and I. When I graduated high school, my senior year, we were finally allowed to use a pocket calculator in class, in math class. So 
using a, using a phone still comes a little bit difficult. Some of the programs and things I still struggle with, but I continuously learn, right? So, so what we're going to do today, so Toyota Safety Sense, why do we have that, okay? So why do you think it's a good idea to have things on your cars that may help you prevent from rear-ending somebody or may help you stay in your lane when you're distracted? Well, what, what would be a good reason to have those items? So, so you don't, yeah, so you don't have an accident. That, that's probably the most obvious one, okay, is so you don't have an accident. Um, so that somebody pulls out in front of you, if you don't react in a split second, the car will react for you and give you a head start on getting that car stopped. Uh, some other reasons are, as a manufacturer, when we go to uh, uh, advertise and sell our products, People want to buy the safest car around, right? Doesn't matter whether it's a Toyota or a Mazda or a, a Lamborghini or whatever. You know, if your family members are going to be getting into a car, or maybe your family members are going to put you into a car, whatever the case may be, they want the safest products around, right? So, if that wasn't the case, we'd all be driving around in you know '66 Camaros and '72 Chevelles and with no airbags and, and none of that stuff. You know, but people want demand safer cars. The other reasons have to do with insurance. Insurance is lower. Insurance rates are lower. Now the repair to a vehicle that has some of these components might be a little bit higher because instead of having a fender bender and maybe busting a grill, well, you can replace the grill, but you also have to replace the millimeter wave radar sensor behind that. So the repair cost might be a little higher, but on the other hand, what if we avoid that accident altogether? So insurance looks at that and says, you know, the cars with, with say, these safety enhancements, our insurance premium, the money we're going to have to pay out in collision money is, is going to be less. So we're all for that. We're going to give you a discount. Just like having a discount years ago, you just got to have a discount if your car had an alarm on it. You know, you, know, you got an alarm, okay, we're going to give you a discount because that's going to deter people from breaking in and stealing stuff, which means we're going to have to pay out less in the way of claims. Okay. It's a comprehensive integrated safety package specifically designed for supporting collision avoidance over a wide range of speed. Low speed, high speed, whatever the case may be. Certain systems work at lower speed, certain systems work at higher speed. Okay. And it's a global package that we're going to introduce on all of our major models throughout the world. Right now some of our vehicles don't have it, some do, but what I was telling the last group is about every five years we do a complete remake of a vehicle. For instance, the Camry 2018 is when we took the Camry and we tore up all the old plans and we started from the ground and built a brand new Camry from the ground up. The only thing that's the same is the name. It has these safety enhancements on it. So we come out, we're coming out with a Corolla hatchback here before long. It's going to have a lot of these safety enhancements. Okay. According to NHTSA, there's over 5 million accidents a year. Some are fatalities, some are fender benders, some are pedestrian collisions, whatever the case may be. So these safety systems that, we've, that we're putting on our vehicles are designed to help prevent a lot of those accidents. So vehicle on vehicle collisions, in other words, you rear-ending somebody or somebody rear-ending you or you uh, sliding off into a ditch, you know, things like that. Traffic lane departures, things like being distracted or maybe dozing off. You know, we've all heard the stories about the guy that fell asleep on the road, crossed three lanes of highway, crossed the median, and hit a dump truck head on. You know, that's things that we're trying to avoid, it's things we're trying to prevent. And then poor night visibility. Maybe somebody's walking along the side of the road, they're wearing blue jeans, dark tennis shoes, a black hoodie, it's dark, lights are on, you know, low beam. You just don't see that individual. They, they step out on the side of the curb and they get clipped. You know, things like that. That's what we're trying to prevent. Okay? So we've got collision avoidance support, lane deviation prevention support, and night visibility support. So we have two safety systems, two TSS systems. We have TSSP, which is on our passenger vehicles and our larger vehicles, such as the Tundra, the Avalon, the Camry. And then we have TSSC, which is more for the compact vehicles, the Corolla, the Yaris, the IA, the IM, cars like that. Main reason we have two different systems is 
they do cost money and they do require extra parts and extra pieces and space for those. So some of our smaller cars don't lend themselves to having everything that a larger like a Tundra would have. We can put more stuff on a Tundra than we can a Tacoma, right? We can put more stuff on a Camry than we could put on a, a Yaris. So, so on TSSP, we have a pre-collision system, okay? Provides collision avoidance, damage mitigation, support, and speed ranges where rear end collisions are likely to occur. Lane departure, provides notification regarding the risk of unintended lane departure, such as dozing off or distraction. Auto high beams. Then we include pedestrian pre-collision system, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, how the system is able to differentiate that that's somebody, a pedestrian, as opposed to a light post or another vehicle. And then we have dynamic radar cruise control, which is a cruise control system that will automatically maintain its distance from the car in front of you no matter what speed they're going. If you've got the cruise set at 70 and that car slows to 35, it's going to maintain that distance no matter what. Okay, and we'll talk some more about that. And then TSSC, we just have the pre-collision, the lane departure alert, and the auto high beams. Okay. Toyota Safety Sense P. So what we use is a single lens camera that is mounted up above in the area of the rear view mirror. It's on the back side of the rear view mirror. It's not part of the rear view mirror, but it's, it's up behind it. Uh, a single lens camera and millimeter wave radar. Millimeter wave radar is in the front grill. You can see the, the little round radar beams coming out, right? Uh, it can also detect potential collisions with pedestrians. A millimeter wave radar enables radar cruise control. So if we give you a camera and we use the camera to look out ahead and see that there's a vehicle in front of you that stopped, well, we could use that camera for other things. Like, we can use that camera to see if there's white or yellow lines on the side of the road. So we can use some items for more than one purpose. So we don't have to put a second camera up there to look at the road and another camera to look at the pedestrians and another camera for the car. So we can combine all these things into one. Millimeter wave radar is particularly effective when detecting vehicles relatively far ahead. And the biggest important thing is it's not easily impacted by adverse weather. We don't want a safety system that if you've got a little fog or a little light rain, that the system shuts itself off. That would, you know, it's like having brakes that only work when the weather's perfect. Not very practical, right? You know, who would want to buy that? We have a computer that only works if, you know, you got some things going and other times it doesn't want to work. It's not very good. Nobody's going to buy that. And a single lens camera can detect objects recognize shapes and white or yellow lane markings. Okay. So Toyota Safety Sense C for the compact, we use a single lens camera and laser radar. So we don't have the millimeter wave radar, now we have laser radar. And you see they both emit, you've got the camera, it's, it has the ca single lens camera and the laser radar. Okay. It can make precise distance measurements even at night or in a short, or short distance effective for detecting vehicles ahead. So it doesn't have the ability to determine whether that's a person or a car, but it knows whatever it is, it's in front of you, it knows how far it is. Okay? That's why we don't have pedestrian detection in the TSSC. Okay? So this is your multi-information display screens. This is the screen that's between the tachometer and the speedometer. Uh, that gives you the ability to turn some things on and off. Lane departure assist, pre-collision, blind spot monitor, parking assist, uh, switch over to lane departure, you can turn steering assist on or off, you can adjust sensitivity, you can turn the sway warning on and off. So you have the ability as a driver to pick and choose what you like. You can turn off pre-collision if you want, you can turn off lane departure if you want. Some things that you can't turn off are things like uh, well, you can turn things off like stability control, but only up to a point. You can turn them off, but once you hit a certain speed, they automatically turn back on. These are safety features like anti-lock brakes. We're going to make sure that you, you, we don't want people turning them off for whatever reason. Blind spot monitor. It uses the millimeter wave radar. It has a sensor mounted at a slight angle in the back inside your rear bumper, in the rear quarters, and it's looking in your blind spot. 
and if it picks up somebody that's in that area, it's going to alert you. And what it does, it will alert you by a little indicator on the mirror. It's got a picture of a car and then a little radar beams and then another car. It'll light up. Now if you go to change, if you turn your turn signal on, it will start blinking faster. Okay. Now, nobody asked this question about the lane departure, which kind of surprised me, but how do you change lanes if it's going to beep at you and, and, and try to nudge your steering wheel back? Exactly. So customer comes in and tells Cole, I bought this new car, and every time I try to change lanes, it beeps at me and the steering gets stiff. It wants to fight me. But what's Cole going to tell her? Well, if you use your turn signal, it cancels that and allows you to change lanes at will. So if you don't use your turn signal, you're either going to have to start using it or you're going to have to turn lane departure off because it will. It will it, you go to, it, it, the steering wheel gets stiff. It's like, it's like somebody's on the other side pulling the wheel the other direction from you. It gets, it gets annoying, but it does two things. One, it's going to keep you from uh, unintentional lane departure. And two, it'll teach you to use your turn signal. So rear cross traffic alert uses the same millimeter wave radar sensors and it's going to pick up people that are crossing behind you. You go to back out of a parking spot and you've got a, 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 a crew max Tundra truck on one side with a lift kit and you've got a moving van on the other. You're backing out and you're like, can't see anything. You know? So you keep creeping back a, a few inches at a time and, and hoping and praying that nobody's going to plow into the back of you. So. This is kind of like giving you eyes all the way at the rear of the bumper. If you start backing up, it'll pick up a car that's coming, either side. And it will also pick up people that are walking behind you. Customer walks out from behind that moving van, it'll start beeping at you. And if need be, it'll apply the brakes and stop the vehicle if it doesn't think that you're going to stop it quick enough. Part of my job, and a large part of my job, is improving the product quality. So I write technical reports. If Cole was to call me up and say, I've got a car that's got this, this or that going on, I may need to go look at that car. I'm going to study that. I'm going to get information. I'm going to get measurements. I'm going to take readings. I'm going to drive the car. I'm going to do whatever I need to do. And I'm going to get all the information I can, and I'm going to submit a, uh, a report back to the engineers. And they're going to do failure analysis. What was the failed part? Why did it fail? Have we seen a lot of these? Is it a trend? Do we need to stop the assembly line and change a, you know, use a different vendor for a part or make a change to a part. So that's part of the interesting, one of the interesting parts of my job. The other part is the legal aspect. So a customer has an accident. They say, the car did it. I was driving along, minding my own business. I wasn't texting, wasn't talking on the phone, wasn't doing any of that stuff and the car just applied the brakes by itself for no reason and a car behind me rear-ended me. So I've got accident damage, the person that hit behind me suing me, but it was the car's fault. So who do they call to gather all the information about what happened to that vehicle? That would be me. So I have special equipment. I can come and I can pull crash data from the airbag computer I can pull pre-collision data from the camera. If you have an incident where the vehicle applies the brakes, if it thinks there's a reason for it and it applies the brakes itself, it will start taking photos. So I have the ability to go in and we can take a look at those photos and we can see did the, what the customers say really happened. What we've got here is this is some of the data that I can pull uh, that we can pull from the vehicle. Now on the left over here you'll see these are all kinds of parameters and this is only a short amount because you can see where our bar is, right? We can scroll that down and we can look at all kinds of stuff we can bring up. So I've just taken three items and I put them up here on, the, on this list, okay? This one is, I call it time to crash, but it's when did the item get detected by the camera and when did we come to a stop, okay? This next one is, when did the car start beeping at you and going, break, break, break? And the bottom is the PCS warning display request. So when did it come on and give you the break in the bold red 
on your, on your information display, okay? So this vehicle, this scenario, this is a training vehicle, so this was all staged. Um, customer said their vehicle came to a stop for no apparent reason. There wasn't anybody in front of them. What are you going to do to fix my car? All right. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to hit the play button down here. So you can be the judge. You tell me it was somebody in front of them. Okay. So I'm not going to say computers never lie, but the information we can get from this, and honestly, some people in a panic situation, they might not remember that somebody was there. They may have been distracted, and by the time they turned around, you know, they were just, oh my gosh, you know, what happened? So we have the ability to go in and look at those items. Now, sometimes it can be, like in this case, for engineering, because like I said, this was staged. We wanted to just see what's on the data list when this occurs. That is not an actual vehicle. That is a uh, styrofoam uh, cutout with uh, PVC on wheels. So if you hit it, it would just roll out of the way. No big deal, right? If we pull the information just for engineering, it's kind of generic, no indicators of who it is, what it is, who owns it. We can put that in a report and the engineers can take it and say, okay, well, they can look at the data. Maybe they can pull the uh, uh, digital data from the system that we pull and find out why this particular vehicle decided that it th thought something was there. So we can use that for engineering purposes. We're not using that in court to do anything. Now, let's say this vehicle had it had applied the brakes and was involved in an accident. Then we have to go to the customer, we have to get the customer's permission to pull this data because it's, it's their private data. It's showing how they drive the vehicle, where they've been, what they've done. It's, it's Privacy Act stuff. So we have to send a form to the customer, we have to get the customer to sign off saying, yes, I'm allowing you to pull it. And once we pull the data, we have to give a copy of it back to the customer. Here's your data, you, here's your copy, my copy is going to be included in this report. You know, give this to your attorney or whoever you want. It, it's your data. You may not be able to read it because some of it's hexadecimal. It's not going to make any sense to you, but it's your data. You know, we're going to pull it. You allowed us to pull it. We're going to give you a copy of it. So I'll give you a copy of the raw data, which is virtually unusable to you. And you may find a company out there. And, and legal firms have people that have the equipment and are trained in crash reconstruction, and they can read these things. Because some of it, some of the data is stored in the airbag computer, such as G-forces in an impact. You know, how much G-force was sustained? Was it, you know, this amount or that amount? Did the airbags deploy? Airbags not deploy? One of the biggest questions we get in this field is, when should an airbag deploy? I've had more than one customer say, well, I had a, I rear-ended somebody and I wasn't hurt but the airbags didn't go off. Should the airbag, I think, I think the airbags should have gone off, okay? So my, re, my reply to that is, were you injured? If the answer is no, then heavens, the airbags shouldn't have gone off because if they had gone off, you probably would be injured. It's not the big pillow that pops out in your face goes boring your own into it. It's, it's like getting hit in the face by George Foreman. Those of you that old enough know who George Foreman is. It's going to hurt, okay? So... It's like a parachute. Nobody says that if you jump out of a plane with a parachute and the parachute opens and does everything it's supposed to, that you're going to land and not have a problem. You might end up with a broken leg or a broken arm or a busted rib. The object is to get you through that alive. Okay? So in an accident, if the airbags deploy, it was a pretty bad accident, and hopefully the airbag is going to keep you from, you know, maybe having major facial reconstruction or, 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 or getting hurt really bad. These are all safety things that are designed to lessen. None of that stuff says that if you have a wreck in our cars that, you know, what was the one movie where the guy had the wreck and the car filled with this, like, white foam and it totally encased him and he gets out of the car and the car's all messed up and he tears his way out of the foam. You know, it's not that type of a system. It's not going to keep you from being injured. It's just going to lessen the impact, hopefully, to you. So there are times where this information, we, we may need to pull it for legal reasons, but if we do, it'll be with the owner's permission, and they will get a copy of that information as well. Some of the diagnostics, some of the things we can do to diagnose. Every component we have on our cars, I don't care if it's the radio, um, 
tire pressure warning, everything has diagnostic trouble codes to it. We have codes. We have uh, codes that are mandated by the federal government. There are codes that the manufacturer can kind of keep to themselves. There's codes that everybody has access to, whether it's AutoZone or a Ford dealer or the independent garage. They have access to those codes, okay? So you go through the codes. You're going to try to determine what's going on with the vehicle. So um, it kind of goes back to what we were, I'm not sure if I talked about this in this session or the previous one, but all these systems are linked together generally by digital communication. We have CAN communication, controller area network. Basically, you have a bus, and you have off of the bus, you have different computers, and they all have their own address where they're at. So uh, all of these sensors are the same way. They all have a communication bus, and they all talk because the pre-collision camera has to tell somebody that there's something out in front of me that I'm going to hit. There has to be a system. There has to be another ECU that determines, well, do I need to apply the brakes or do I just need to turn on the warning and sound the buzzer? What do I need to do? So all these things are linked together. So that's where you're going to use the diagnostic trouble code and, and the, the, the keys to go through and find out exactly what particular component that might be. Sometimes you may have to use a known good part. We run across that occasion where they'll call the technical assistance hotline and they'll say, well, we've had some problem with this, but try a known good one go out and duplicate the concern and see if that takes care of it. If it does, then you know what parts you need to order. So anyway, diagnostics are really good on our vehicles. So components and component replacement. When you have a camera or a sensor or anything that's looking out of the vehicle, it needs to be aimed, right? It, it, we got to make sure it's looking. We don't want a sensor looking over here when we're going down the road this way. It makes no sense. So. All of our components, whether it's the blind spot monitors in the rear, uh, the forward-looking camera, the millimeter wave radar sensor, all that stuff has a calibration parameter. So if you have a car that was involved in an accident and it, it, it damaged the front bumper and it uh, busted the grill, which behind the grill is where your millimeter wave radar sensor is, right? Your camera's up here behind the glass. So you may have to take it to a dealer and have a technician such as yourself go through and calibrate that sensor or make sure that when they put the body back together they got it straight okay because not all body shops are as good as others we've seen cars that we look at and we're like man that looks pretty good and the others are like man that looks pretty good you know so you may be called upon to go through a calibration process part of that calibration process is going to be you're going to find the center line of the vehicle the way we do it is we drop a plumb bob, we drop a line of the plumb bob on the rear, center of the rear emblem and the center of the front emblem. We put a piece of tape down. Then we run a line between those two. That tells us the center line of the vehicle. The vehicle's got to be on a flat surface. We can't be uphill or on a side angle or anything like that. And then it may require you taking a uh, target such as this and putting it on a stick at a certain height out in front of the vehicle at a certain distance on center line and then going in with the handheld test or the text stream computer and seeing if the camera is seeing that where it's supposed to be. Uh, windshield replacement. There's places now that will come to your house to replace your windshield, right? Do they know that they need to go through and zero point and calibrate that camera when they replace your windshield? They may not. More are finding out. Uh, I know a dealership the other day got a call from a glass company and they sent two guys over to see what is required when they replace a windshield. And finally they said, well, we're just going to tell the customer we'll replace the windshield, we're going to have a mirror hanger, tell them they need to go to the dealer and have that calibrated, contact your insurance company. Because it takes more time and more information, information, more electronic equipment that the glass company doesn't have. I mean, they're used to just cutting the glass out, cleaning, putting a sealer in, putting the windshield in, putting some tape on it, putting a mirror hanger, says, you know, don't, don't roll the windows up for four hours or whatever. That, that's as much as they, they do. More and more of this stuff is going to uh, come into play when it comes to insurance companies and repairs on your vehicle.